Well, I very much agree with, of course, the famous statement by Margaret Mead that a, that a small group of concerned citizens can change the world, and actually nothing else ever did change the world. In other words, the power of people getting together and studying documents and trying carefully to assess them, advising one another, and then on the basis of that knowledge pre presenting uh, views on what would be appropriate courses of action to the general public is a very valuable one. I think a lot of people believe that in order to talk about something technical like nuclear power, they, they need a science background or mathematics background or something. And I think that's a huge role that the coalition has played is to say, you know, you can read these things, they make fact sheets and so forth that are trying to get out the major facts. And that I, I, uh, had no math background and no chemistry and no physics, but some of it is just common sense and a lot of it is morals. I think it's an immoral technology, but I think um, people can, I've put on a lot of hearings with coalition members and others in the community and, and I usually have people come over to our house. I have a huge library of documents and and talk with somebody about, you know, what, what about nuclear power is of concern to you or radioactive waste, and then I give them a topic and give them stuff to read. I usually just sort of, if I know that somebody's at all interested or sometimes they'll phone and say, what can I do to help or something. Um, if, they, if they get into our house, I, they don't get out without a topic or something, but they, they want to help people. I think people feel strongly about helping with the environment. And that's what the coalition has been really very good about, is providing information. And it has had a library in the, in the past of good documents and getting people informed about the issues. And well, the coalition started right in the time when environmental uh, interests, environmental problems were beginning to achieve widespread national attention. Uh, the uh, lead up to Earth Day in 1970 was, uh, was a time when people's attentions were being focused. And of course, here in St. Louis, Barry Commoner, who organized the, the, the preceding organization that eventually gave rise to or grew into the Coalition for the Environment, was one of the very first prophets in the wilderness talking about the environment, environmental problems of different kinds. It was very interesting for me because it was November 13th, 1974, and my neighbor next door, Loretta Murphy, had come over two days before then, and she said she had met an engineer at a party the night before, and then he told her that Union Electric was going to build a nuclear power plant in, the, in Missouri. They wanted to, and that it would be built on a limestone plateau, and, and Loretta said the engineer told her that if the water got out, of the reactor that the, the fuel could get hotter and hotter and melt right through the building and get into the groundwater and there could be a, an explosion of radioactive steam and she said Kay you've got to do something about it so I she went home and and then the next night I happened to meet I saw somebody who asked if I was going to testify the next day at a hearing in Clayton, um, at Missouri Senate Committee hearing. So I just read up as much as I could and wrote my speech from the back of the hearing room as I usually often do, and um, have been working on it ever since because I really feel that, I mean, it's a, absolutely a dirty, dangerous, and expensive technology. And I, we've just, I just completed a pamphlet that I've been working on with Arlene Sandler on the coalition board. We've been working for five years off and on on our pamphlet, and it is about to be printed probably in a week. <laughs> so, and it's, um, it's called Nuclear Power is Dirty, Dangerous, and Expensive. Oh, God. Long ago and far away, I don't know. I really don't know what. We started with the Open Space Council, and uh, after it had been in existence a few years, we enlarged it by uh, establishing this second organization, Coalition for the Environment. The idea originally was to 
preserve a certain amount of open space undeveloped in the St. Louis region. The yeah. Open Space Council was just interest, interested in land use and Coalition for the Environment was interested in all the resources, water and everything else as well as land use. Well, we, we went on many pleasant float trips with the Drys and the Booters and uh, Ben Roth and Peter Schmitz uh, on the um, Huzzah and on the uh, Jack's Fork and on the Current. Yeah, every spring and every fall we had a float trip and it was, we just, we did that for years until some of us got too weak to paddle. I will say that Leo Dry is the best canoe paddler I've ever known. I've followed him for miles on the current in the Jack's Fork, and he could sit in the stern of his canoe, and Kay will sit in the bow and won't lift her paddle, and he will just barely move his paddle back and forth and keep that canoe head, headed towards the V of any uh, ripples and, and in the deepest part of the river at all times. So I know that if I can stay right behind Leo, I'll, I'll keep clear of the uh, shallow water. Well, he never tipped over and mm -hmm. everybody else did. <laughs> yeah, Leo used to take, uh, take us ashore sometimes to show us the biggest pine in uh, White Pine Shannon in County or something. No, like that. in Missouri. You know, Missouri. It, uh, they his way, his method of forestry was to save those big trees, and he could find them. He'd take us into well, this. Well, they were on his property. Yes. For the most part, yeah. And he and he knew them. By, he was familiar with them because they were his, and we and he was proud to introduce us to the big trees. And he was very much at home in the Ozarks. He knew, he knew the people there and uh, resonated with them. It stood in, in my mind as a uh, symbol and a representation of the interest the public had in the preservation of uh, open space. And, and I felt that it was uh, something to be supported and participated in. I think their efforts on clean air were most, most important. Yeah. And uh, Lou Green was very involved with that. And they, it, the state did establish a Clean Air Commission, or I'm not sure what it was called, but I think they took those steps because of the coalition. That's right, and, and Lewis Green, I think, was appointed by the governor as the first chairman of the Clean Air Commission because he'd had such a big part in uh, uh, getting that legislation adopted. At the very beginning of the coalition, I did all the mailing and my kids helped and the, the mailing was done from my dining room table for a couple of years, I think. I was like the secretary and my kids got good at sticking envelopes and putting on stamps and things like that. And talk about that a little more. So it really was sort of a, a family affair for... Well, for a while, until we got an office. Well, this was when it was just first starting. And then eventually we got an office and, and we got a director. We collected a lot of signatures on petitions for various things and we got all the kids involved in that. I think my children spent their childhood collecting signatures. Right, I guess I was eight when the coalition had its first meeting. It says October 11th, 1969. I guess that was my eighth birthday, but I don't remember that being where I celebrated my birthday, but it must have been. <laughs> and I grew up stuffing envelopes, 
and stamping them. I'm an extremely fast envelope stuffer now, and I can get the stamps, get them all lined up and do the stamps now too. I have to do some envelopes for Great Rivers now, and it's no problem. I have a good background in it. They talked about trying to preserve the land or floodplain that they were trying, that the coalition was working on then. And my father would come home and say, that darn judge, but he'd use probably worse words than that in my memory. And he, if, if he ever lost, it was that darn judge's fault. And that judge was no, no darn good, but he wouldn't say that. So we talked about uh, his cases quite a bit, I think, and the battles. And my mother, uh, as the membership chairman, was on the telephone a lot, recruiting people to help. Back in the 70s, we finally had some good, strong environmental legislation. You know, you got the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act uh, at a federal level. State laws were being passed to, um, to conform to these federal acts. And, um, and we had public commissions that were set up to monitor these things. But most of the time, you'd have the industry that was being regulated going to the commission and asking for a variance, and that would be it. There'd be nobody speaking on behalf of the environment because the industry had their paid lobbyists or their you know, lawyers or their planners or whomever it might be that could, and they could afford to spend days in these hearings. The environmental community had <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> and that was actually one of the reasons the Coalition for the Environment was, was really created, at least in my understanding of the earliest days. Uh, we need to find somebody who we can send to these meetings to be a presence, to witness on behalf of the environment, to say uh, to the commissioners, hey, think about the environment. And there are really two ways uh, that the Coalition primary ways that I see that the coalition can have a positive impact. One is through, if something is going astray, then calling attention to that through the media and to the general public. And hopefully if, if enough members of the public learn about that, it will have political repercussions in terms of pointing out that no, most of the public doesn't agree with this decision. Let's change it. Um, and political leaders, agency officials will kind of change their conduct in, rela in response to public pressure. That the coalition can help kind of ferret out the facts, what's happening, get that out to the public. So that's one way I think that the coalition can be an effective watchdog organization. The other way is that, um, you know, as a result of the environmental movement that started in the 60s and then carried through the 70s, uh, there were a lot of very good laws that were passed, in, the, in particular in the early 1970s. And we have decent laws on the books to deal with a lot of environmental issues. It's that they're not always enforced as they should be. And so uh, I think the coalition has the resources and can be effective by pursuing that through court, by requiring agencies and or people who need to comply with environmental regulations to do so uh, through the court of through a court of law um, and that that's hard maybe for individual citizens to do you know I mean it's an expensive process it's a lengthy process so you need kind of a, a, a focused organization that has some resources and time devoted to that uh, to pursue a lawsuit through through court well first of all what about that legacy question I mean what is uh what has been the, the great accomplishment of, of the coalition? Survival. <laughs> uh, anytime an organization that comes in, uh, you know, kind of trying to live off a shoestring, I mean, donations, grants, contracts, whatever you can get to kind of eke out an existence, maintain an office, maintain a staff, and work on, on public issues that, um, don't generate a revenue um, and then continue on for 40 years, I think you've got a great accomplishment. The fact that we've been able to, to, to maintain an organization and actually grow, we've got a very talented and, and um, you know, really experienced staff now at the Coalition of the Environment, far more experienced than what we had back in the 70s, um, I, I would say is, is testament to uh, both longevity and also perseverance.
you know, Roger Pryor was, of course, the executive director for many years and a staff person before being executive director. And uh, Roger knew that you had to compromise at some point to get something done. But sometimes I think he was uh, harder on the people who he was working with uh, that were on the same side than he, than he was maybe with the opposition who he knew uh, 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 were going to be opposed to what he was doing. I was trying to, you know, get you to do more and more and, and concentrate, you know, more uh, on one or two particular issues when there's always, you know, a broad field of legislation that any given legislator has to pay attention to, but that's particularly true when you're in the Senate. Solid waste uh, was a big issue at a particular point there uh, when Roger uh, was heading the uh, uh, coalition, so he was very much involved in that. But um, he was involved in everything. I mean, he had a real um, solid background on so many issues, and he, um, you know, he read a lot, he knew a lot. I mean, he, he really devoted uh, um, lots of time, personal time, as well as uh, time as uh, director and staff of the coalition. So he, uh, it, it would be hard to pick out one or two issues because he was just deeply involved with, uh, with everything. A democracy and we depend on well-informed people taking steps to improve all of our lives and in that sense I think the coalition has played a valuable role and has helped to make the development of the St. Louis area much sounder than it would have been if the coalition had not existed. Basically how the Clean Water Act works is that the, e or the Congress passes these federal statutes and then it says to states you can implement these and we'll give you money to implement these 
But if you don't do it correctly, eventually we'll take that responsibility back and e the federal EPA will do it. So for, uh, and Missouri is not alone, but perhaps was further behind than others, but Missouri had not adopted all the regulations and sort of the infrastructure and that needed to be put in place to uh, enforce the Federal Clean Water Act. Uh, in particular, setting standards for bacteria in water. And so this was kind of a prime role, I think, for an out outside advocacy group to step in and call attention to what was happening and also call attention to it to a federal court uh, to say, look, these regulations are not in place. Look at what we need to do. So after about a year of, of litigating, we had 16 claims in our lawsuit. We settled in a favorable way 14 of those claims with the EPA. And so that has kicked off you know, something that's still going on is the state finally putting in place those regulations uh, to enforce the Clean Water Act. Uh, I first became involved with the Missouri Coalition for the Environment mostly through following my mother, Pamela Todorovich, uh, around to environmental uh, protests and organizing events and the first that I remember is that we attended several meetings at the home of K-Dry um, about uh, trying to stop the routine release of treated uh, water used at the Callaway nuclear power plant in outside of St. Louis. Um, so I attended several of those meetings. Uh, they were very much grassroots organi organizing and activism, um, met some of the other people who were involved in that effort. And that gave me a, a taste for doing more. I, I really got excited about the possibilities as a young person of getting involved in environmental activism. Now personally, I would like my children and my grandchildren and grandchildren beyond that to be able to enjoy the great biodiversity that I have enjoyed in my lifetime. And I would hate for them to see a world devoid of many of these exciting farms. In the state of Missouri, in the city of St. Louis, the coalition through public efforts, through the news releases and through general and through membership, is making the general public aware of the issues that are, we have right here locally. Where a zoo and the zoos combined are working on an international level Every effort has to be reinforced on a very local level, all the way down to a park in South St. Louis. And I can remember um, speaking at the Clean Air Commission, probably 1978, uh, about some issues and saying, you know, these are, these are critical for our children. And then the next year, 1979, my oldest son was born and I remember going so it was probably 80 then going back to that commission and saying I have a one-year-old I want him to grow up in a clean environment and having one of the uh, the commissioners come over to me afterwards and say you know I hadn't thought about my children in quite that way before I say oh maybe maybe we're actually getting through it's just education you know um, the, the quality of the environment that we work to create today is what is going to help our children in the future.